Welcome you to tonight's time of study as we go into the Word of God and examine some scriptures I believe that will be helpful to us, particularly at this time which we're living. In fact, uh, thing, the title that God has given me for this evening, uh, I was wondering how is it going to fit in to all of the activities that we've been engaged in and the things that we're experiencing, but it's always appropriate to talk about life, to understand life, to understand as we call this subject, or call this series, our uh, message, 
the mysteries of life, those twists and turns that life will take and how do we understand them? How do we comprehend life and have the right perspective on life? And in this, we wanna take an examination as we begin to look at our own lives. And I believe and I trust that as a result of what you hear this evening, it will give you a whole different view on life. We understand that life, uh, that we look at life from a comprehensive point of view. We see the beginning of life, but when life begins, we also see the purpose of life, what life means. And then thirdly, we come to the place where we come to the end of life. Or we talk about the end of life. Some people think about the end of life as being the finality or uh, the cessation of existence. But we look at it in this perspective, we look at it this way as being uh, reaching life's destiny or reaching life's goal. The place that we are striving to end up, this will be the end of life. The scripture that I believe is very appropriate in this, we start here in Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 5. This is what it says here. He says, just as you'll never understand the mystery of life forming in a pregnant woman, so you'll never understand the mystery at work in all that God does. I believe this is out of the message paraphrase. Let me read it again, because I want you to really pay attention to these words. They're very potent. It says, just as you'll never understand the mystery of life. And it speaks of life as it is forming uh, in a pregnant woman, in the womb of a mother. So you'll never understand the mystery of, at work in all that God does. So he compares the formation of this fetus, as some would call it, or this embryo as this child is growing in the womb of the mother. He said, it's a mystery how this uh, little seed that was planted can eventually become an embryo and eventually develop into a full grown child that's ready to be uh, delivered. He said, now, if you can understand this, we understand that science can examine it and we can uh, measure certain things in relation to childbirth and even how ch children grow from the seed into a child in the womb, but none can fully understand it. And he says, so Let's compare this to your understanding of the mystery at work in all that God does. God is involved in this mystery, but then it is saying, in essence, God is involved in every mystery. So that's why we say that life itself is a mystery, because this is the hand of God, the work of God taking place, and it is beyond our human comprehension even though he would allow us to understand certain things, but to fully understand all of the dynamics that occur, none of us can fully understand it. So when we talk about our view of life, because this is how I want you to see life as being. We want you to understand that life comprises of the past, the present, and the future. When we talk about how life, we look at life from a comprehensive point of view, we understand life to uh, be a part of the past, the present, and the future. Understand that we didn't just come into being, but there was a whole lot of activity that took place before we came on the scene. We have mothers and fathers, and then before that, grandparents, great-grandparents, and you could go back all the way back to Adam and we can see that somebody was involved in bringing us into being. So we look at the past, we have to understand, examine the past. The question that many are asking today is where did I, where did I come from? Trying to research their histories and uh, understand many get lost in that, trying to go back and re-examine their roots. But in this, we realize that we are also in the present and understand we had nothing to do with how we 
came here, how we arrived, but we have everything to do with what we do with our lives now that we're here. So we look at our lives as we live them from day to day, as we live in this present time. And then here's the other part, is life comprises of the future. It also, we uh, actually project into the future. We're able to, God sometimes will give us a glimpse into the future. We get a prophetic view of the future when we go into the word of God. Many, as we read the scripture, God is showing us our future. Uh, you see the ifs, the conditions, if you do this, then this will happen. If you don't do a particular thing, that this will be the outcome. So the outcome of our lives are determined by the activities that we are engaged in now, because what we're doing now, we're seeding now for our future. So now, as we look at the whole thing of child bearing again, uh, the Bible says in Isaiah 26 and verse 17, it gives us the same picture. We talk about child wearing, child bearing, and a woman who carries uh, a baby within her uh, womb. And we see that as a mystery, as a mystery. But in the 17th verse, it says, as a woman with child is in pain and cries out in pains, when she draws near the time of her delivery, so have we been in your sight, O Lord. We have been with child, we have been in pain, we have, as it were, brought forth wind. Let's, let, let's stop there for a moment. Let's look at what the prophet was really saying. He says, we understand that the woman that's carrying a child is, uh, childbirth can be very painful. You understand that a part of what happened when, uh, the, I would say, the penalty of Eve's sin, or Eve's uh, being, uh, she, she was uh, deceived. But then he said, in, in, in pain, you shall bring forth children. So we understand that uh, many women, even today, curse uh, uh, Eve because of that. But it says, now the woman is in pain. And uh, understand, and, and if you've ever seen that, you'll see how it's a painful experience. Some people tell me that that's one of the most painful experiences one could ever engage in. I, I told them, I said, I had surgery and some other things. I said, nothing could be any worse than what I've gone through. But many mothers would disagree and say that there's no pain as intense as uh, giving birth to a child. But he says, but as this woman with child is in pain, she cries out in pains. But when she draws near the time of delivery, so have we been in your sight, O Lord. Now understand the pain, understand when a woman is in pain and she's carrying the child, when she delivers a child, the joy uh, overrides the pain that she's gone through. It's a bad time to ask a mother if she wanna have another child before she delivered the child. <clears throat> but after the child is born, we can talk about the future. But here, it says that she has uh, gone to this time of delivery, time of delivery. Now, mind you, as we look at all of the events that's taking place and we talk about things that are happening uh, and the seeds that are being planted that are ripe for revival, uh, I believe that this is something that God is preparing us for. He, he's, we talked about seed time and harvest just a few weeks ago and how God is uh, uh, the seed of the word, the words that God is giving us and the instructions that we're receiving is all seed that God is planting within our, our, in our hearts and our lives. First of all, we receive it in our minds, and then it's in our hearts so that it can germinate within us and become life within us. It says, so now, this is what he's really saying. This is a prophetic word spoken. He says, we, we have been with child. We have gone through all the pains that we are to go through. He says, when, when we've been with child, we've gone, we've had the pain. He says, now we have, as it were, instead of bringing forth a child, it says, she brought forth wind. In other words, she was pregnant or she had the appearance of being pregnant. She had when all of the signs of being pregnant, we begin to look at uh, the swelling and 
all the other signs that a woman carry when she's pregnant. She said, all of these things were happening with this particular woman. He says, but when the time of delivery came, all she did was broke wind. She brought forth wind. In other words, uh, that's what happened. She released herself. It, say, it says, and then it goes on and says, we have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth. Oh, that's a poor habit, as, as an epitaph. He says, after all we have received, after all has been planted within us, he said, we have not accomplished any deliverance in the earth. The question is, with our lives and all that we've received over the years, how many people have benefited from the fruit of our lives? How many people are being blessed through what God has, in fact, given us? He says, nor have the inhabitants of the world fallen. Neither have, this is what the prophet was saying, neither have we defeated the enemies. He said, in, any, in other words, the enemy is still as uh, alive as he's always been. The enemy is still threatening, and the things, the activities within the earth are still the same. Even though we are alive, God has given us life in this generation for this purpose, for this reason, to be the difference in the earth as it was with David, who served the purpose of God in his generation. After having served the purpose of God, then he slept with his fathers. And the Bible went on to say his body saw corruption. But in this, our lives must be lived in purpose, with purpose and on purpose. Her life, from which new life is to pass through. This is a mother. It was her life with which new life was to pass through. Her, the life that was to bring, uh, produce birth, or the birth that was to come to pass, was to pass through her birth canal. And now in that, there was a formation that was to take place. And understand when a woman is pregnant, the formation has taken place. The Bible talks about he has formed us. Uh, uh, even before we were formed in the, moon, uh, in the womb, he knew us. The Bible helps us understand the knowledge of God, the foreknowledge of God. And he says, so in that, after formation has taken place, there has to be a time, we call it, then the presentation occurs, where we are presented. And that's when the child is given birth. I remember it with our children, where the doctor would place the child uh, upon Francine's uh, breast. But also, uh, I have had opportunity to hold the child right after the child had been delivered. So in that, we begin to see that the presentation, this is your... Uh, in other words, they'll say, congratulations, you're now a father. And it wasn't that I wasn't a father beforehand, but now with the child in my arms, the evidence of fatherhood was present before all. Then, as we look at what God is doing, as we look at the president, then after that, there has to be a movement towards realization. Realization. We talk about the child now, realizing who he is or who she is, coming to a place of awareness. But how do they come to that place of awareness? Or how, we see the process of, of, of coming through that place of awareness is observing things all around him or her. Observing, observation. Becoming familiar with the environment in which uh, you were uh, given birth. We begin to look at things around us. What do I do with this? What do I do with that? What would I do with the other? The environment in which we live. God has placed us in this environment for a specific purpose. These things that are happening around us aren't coincidental. The reason you were born, the reason I was born, is to fit perfectly into the equation of the events that's taking place in this day and this hour. Now, now, now in this, we have to understand the, the value or, or the lack thereof placed upon life. Because we talk about your living, your life has been given you as a gift of God so that you can make a difference in the lives of others and in the environment all around you. But we have to understand the value of life. And then there are those that do not understand the value of life. But, but understand, this is what, when the scripture talks about salvation, when the Bible talks about being saved, saved, it really means to save your life. He is really saying to us, I am come to give you life. I came to save your life. How, what do you mean, save your life? He is saying that, in other words, look at it this way. Many of you are still lost in the activity of living. Listen to me now. Lost 
in the activity of living. Now, I talk about loss in the activity of living. Loss, it is your life, your, your self-life. That's what you're talking about. Your, people are so busy uh, a living life that they never come to the place of understanding life as it ought to be lived. See, life is, uh, then, if that be the case, then life is defined by the activities you're currently engaged in. And, and if you are defining life, by and through the activities that you're currently engaged in, then you become a slave to whoever and whatever you yield your bodies to obey. The scripture says that. It talks about whatever you yield your members to obey, you become a slave to it. So you become a slave to the activities that you're engaged in. In other words, your life is defined by what you do because you never come to the place of really understanding who you really are. It's important to understand this. If you really, if you never come to the place of understanding who you are, you will define yourself by what you do. So now we look at the activities in which people are engaged in, and that's how they define life. They say, this is life. When you begin to, you come to the end of life, you say, what was your life all about? Well, I did this, I did that, the other. Did you really come to the place of understanding what life was really about? So in this, as we look at it, God is wanting us to understand what it means to glorify him, uh, to, to glorify him. In fact, this is what the scripture, I, wa I want to read this scripture out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7. This is what it says here. It says, it says, when we speak wisdom, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. We're going back to this mystery again. The mystery, hidden truth, that which God knows, but he reveals, he hides it for us but yet he allows us to see it in the appropriate time. It says now, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden truths of God. Let me tell you something. Uh, I, I always, why is God saying this to us now? He is saying, this is the time for this message to be delivered to you because all of the experiences leading up to this moment was preparation so that when you hear the word of the Lord, you could embrace that truth, and that truth could become life within you. So now we're going to see the mysteries of God. He, he says, uh, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. He said, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Look at this now. He, he, he says, I've hidden it. I've hidden it, brother. But God ordained it when it was hidden. In other words, it was meant for you. It was it was actually, your name was stamped on it. God said, this is a letter that I have sent to you. He said, but it's only to be delivered at the appropriate time. Have you ever had it during Christmas time when they, uh, the gifts are there and they said, do not open until Christmas? Because what happens, you, uh, it's to be celebrated at that particular time. The same thing applies. He says, I have a gift for you. I have some wisdom for you. He says, but I will not unfold it until the appropriate time. There will be a time when you will begin to understand, or I, I will expose to you the mysteries. This is what Paul was actually doing, the mysteries that have been hidden before the ages. He said, but they were hidden for our glory. They were hidden for our glory. Now we talk about glory. He says, uh, glory is the finished product. Glory is coming to understand the eternal purpose fulfilled. What was God wanting to do? How was God intending to unfold this mystery? How was he intending for this thing to be lived out in such a way that it would be beneficial to you and beneficial to others? So now he said, this is the mystery, hidden mystery ordained uh, for our glory. He says, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He used the word glory twice. He speaks of it. He said, it was hidden for your glory, but they crucified the Lord of glory. Now understand what he's saying here. He is saying that, that uh, the, the mystery, understand what the mystery is. The mystery is in Christ because the mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He said, he said what I'm going to do, Christ being revealed to you, but now it will not just be Christ revealed to you, but it will be Christ 
residing on the inside of you, living his life through you. He said, this is a mystery. He said, I, I, I'm bringing you to a place where you will not be, it would not be necessary for you, for someone to tell you to do this, that, or the other. He said, because the teacher will be on the inside of you. Now understand what he's saying. He says, I've hidden it for your glory. Glory, the finished product. I've hidden this for, in order to finish the work, the work that began in you. When, before you were born, we understand that your life comprised of past, present, and future. We look at a history, uh, present, as well as uh, future. So now, he says, the glory of God. He says, how will you finish this thing out? He said, the mystery is that, which will bring you to the place of finishing what was started. Now, in this, we talk about what was started for all humanity, because we understand that it, it, it began with the Jews, but it was for all man. He died for all. So now he says, he said, uh, his eternal purpose is being fulfilled. He said, but this is what they did now. If they had known this, if, if the rulers of this age knew, if those who were in authority had known this, that's what he's really saying. We talk about the princes, the kings, the uh, potentates, all the people in charge, if they had known this, they, if for, had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. It says, so now we begin to see those who are in authority crucifying the one that would bring them to the place of glory. They would not have taken his life since he is the giver of life. So in other words, they cut, they cut their lives short by taking the life of the one who is the life giver. That's what they were really doing. He says, he says, if you had known me, if, if you had known me, you would have asked of me. If you had known me, you would have come to me. All of these things. So it is saying that the rejection of the Lord is as a result of people lacking the knowledge of the Lord. If you had known him, you would love him. Did you see that? So now the world, we look at the vacuum that exists. And I would say where well, the enemy has killed the vacuum with all kind of other things because people did not know the Lord. That's why so many are working against him and hating him because they don't know him as he is. So now as we look at this, if they had recognized that he was the giver of life, that he was, uh, that he was the only way that they would ever accomplish that which they were born to accomplish, it was in him and through him. You can't finish without him. That's what it's really saying. In other words, your life's purpose, the end, your life's end cannot be accomplished without the Lord. Regardless of how you, we say we define life based upon observation, we base life based upon experiences and the like, but to really understand life, life cannot be lived without him. Now, now, now if you look at that, we talk about how they crucified the Lord of glory, but, but, but this is what God will do. He gives us a foretaste of glory divine. He allows us to sample uh, life. You, that's what we're doing now. We, we get a foretaste of life. We get a sampling of life now. But yet, understand, it's only, uh, they call it a foretaste of glory divine. Uh, uh, in other words, even to this degree, we have a glimpse of life. We see through a glass dimly. Uh, we, we still don't see life in its fullness. We don't see life in its fullness. We see enough of life to desire life. Uh, it, you, you see, that's what God does within us. It's just enough life for us to desire life because you understand now, in fact, we have received eternal life. We talk about the life uh, that he has given us. There's no more life to be added to that. But I'm talking about the experience of life, the, the, the culmination, the unfolding of life, the understanding and comprehension of life. That takes place over time. In fact, when, we, when, when sin, when the uh, element of sin is removed from us, then we're free enough to see life in its totality. But here, uh, we begin to look at life and, 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 and those that have had a foretaste, those that have had a glimpse of life, the Bible says in six, uh, Hebrews 6 and 4, it says, and, and that scripture messed me up one time, when I first uh, received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and uh, was disappointed and I wanted to uh, go back into the world because I felt that this thing wasn't working and things weren't taking place as quickly as I thought they ought. And, and this is the very scripture that I was really, uh, uh, I would say, uh, stumbling over. It says, for it's impossible for those 
who were once enlightened. We have to understand what that means, to be enlightened. What does it mean to be enlightened? Once you were enlightened, and this says, and have tasted the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God, and the powers of the age to come. Now understand what it's saying. It talks about a lot of things would have had to occur in that person's life. He says they have been enlightened. In other words, illuminated. They have, they have seen enough. In other words, God has opened their minds, the eyes of their minds to understand to a degree things that they otherwise would not understand. He said they've been enlightened and then they have tasted, they have tasted of the heavenly gift. When it talks about tasting of the heavenly gift, they have already not only seen it, but they have experienced that which comes from the Lord. And then it says, not only have they uh, experienced it, they have been partakers of the Holy Spirit. He says, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. So in other words, this person has a glimpse of glory. This person has already glimpsed into the eternal. It says, now it says, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance. Because we talk about coming to that place of reprobation, hearts being hardened, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Uh, this is how the message puts it. It said, once people have seen the light, gotten a taste of heaven, and been part of the work of the Holy Spirit, once they've personally experienced the sheer goodness of God's word and the powers breaking in on us. Oh, that's so potent. If they, if then they turn their backs on all of that, if they turn all that God has shown them, all that God has made available to them, they turn their back on it, washing their hands of the whole thing. Well, they can't start over as if nothing happened because they know too much. He said, that's impossible. Why? They've re-crucified Jesus. They've repudiated him in public. In other words, they have gotten to the place where they have, have washed their hands of spiritual truth. They have minimized or, uh, or, or, or tried to bring things to a level of, 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 a, of a lack of being important, things that are of utmost importance. He says, so you cannot go back and, re it's like re-crucifying Jesus Christ all over again. Now, now in this, as we begin to look at, uh, uh, that, that's the person that has tasted and the person that has experienced and whatever. But then we look at a child, we look at a person that's a child uh, in, in the things of God, a person that had not matured to that level, a person who had not matured to that degree, but yet, and this is all of us at one time, or another, because we were all at one time children. And, and the Bible says that we would no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by, by the trickery of man, whereby they lay in wait to deceive. But uh, it, it's growing up in him and, and, and being at a place where we mature in the things of God. But here, the Bible talks about children and understand this is a phase that we go through in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. It says, when I was a child, you know it, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when did I do those things? When I was a child. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I understood like a child. And I thought like a child. So now you understand, I, I talked as if I was a child. I couldn't talk maturely, I couldn't speak as a mature person because, and I, because I couldn't understand as a mature one would understand. And all you're getting at understanding, we should not be at a place, if you've been with the Lord over a period of time, that you still need baby food. But things that will contribute to your spiritual growth and development. He says, but when I was a child, that's what I needed. I spoke like a child and I understood like a child. So now you don't place too much upon the child because the child doesn't have the wherewithal to absorb the things that you would try to bring to him or her. He said, and I thought like a child. 
But then it says, but when I became, listen to it now, but when I became a man, it is saying that this is a process. It says over a period of time, I was no longer a child. I went through, I went through infancy, childhood. Uh, I, then I was a teenager, young adult. Now I am a full grown man. Now, if I begin to revert back to my infancy and childhood and uh, teenage years and the like, then, then, then something's wrong. I'm not developing as I'll develop. You, you, you see, there, there's some, there's some uh, developmental issues here. So now it says that when I became a man, what do you do? I put away uh, childish things. I put away childish things. No longer was I there to be entertained. No longer was I about uh, playing uh, and, and, and engaged in games and that kind of thing. I put away childish things. Now, now, understand this. Uh, that's why it's important that we understand as uh, mature saints, the world is waiting on the sons of God. The earnest expectation of all creation is waiting on the manifestation of sons. Sons has to do with maturity. Sons has to do with those who have reached a level of maturity so that you can take on spiritual responsibilities. But then he says, now, if we look at this, it is saying that, uh, but even that even though we've come to a place of manhood or adulthood, he said, but we still see through a glass dimly. We still see in a mirror dimly. That's why we said that we still do not see it all, all that life is all about, all that the glory of God in his fullness, those things we cannot fully see. But he said, but then the time will come when we will see face to face. He says, now I know in part, partial knowledge and understand is unfolding because we are engaged in what's called progressive revelation. We understand to a degree, but our understanding continues to increase so that every time we come together, each time we read the word, in fact, we pray, meditate, we're growing in grace, knowledge of the Lord. He says, so now uh, we know in part, but then I will know even as I'm known. I will know even as I'm known. In other words, there'll come a time when we enter into glory. And that's when God will open our eyes to the reality of the things that we merely see through a glass dimly. We just did a home uh, going to for one of our members, Sister Betty. And in that, when we were at that home going, I said about this very same thing. Very, I didn't have a five minutes to share, but I was thinking about the same thing. I said, now, I said, I trust that she would not be shocked or amazed when she see the glories of heaven based upon the instructions given to her on earth. I said, because I wanted to, I wanted the glimpse of glory that, that she saw even from this house would be vivid enough that she would say that it, it was very symbolic or at least it, 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 it lined up with what she is seeing now. So, so uh, we understand that as we move from childhood to adulthood, and we talk about uh, to spiritual maturity as we grow up to become sons of God. And then the time when we are joined with him, that we are known even as we we know, even as we're known. But when we talk about a childhood in our childhood phase, a child is uh, just like a slave. Even though the Bible says, and uh, I think it's uh, Galatians 4 and 1, it says, even though he's an heir, uh, uh, he's an heir even though he has an inheritance, but yet at the time he cannot manage the inheritance, therefore he is not given that inheritance. In other words, we mentioned God would not give us that which we're not able to manage. It would be uh, unfair to God to place in our hands something that we are incapable of managing. But then he is, under, he is like a slave because he's under guardians and stewards uh, that tutor him along the way. And, and we understand that that's those that are under the law, but we also see it compared to children and childhood. It is saying that uh, there are certain things. He said, well, I want, I want a car. Well, you can't handle a car. I want this. I want, you can't handle it yet. But as you grow, then this is reserved for you when you grow into it. And that's what God does for us. He says, I'm, I'm giving you, I, I, I have things for you, but I want you to grow into your inheritance. 
I want you to grow into your inheritance. So what God is doing, even as we are receiving these instructions, he's getting us ready for what he has already prepared, prepared for us. He says, I'm preparing you for what I prepared for you. And that's what God does. Now, this is what, uh, as we grow, then we're given greater responsibilities. If you can't manage or handle small responsibilities now, last week we talked about we talked about kinship and family and households. And uh, if you can't handle the small things, then you best believe you're not in position to handle the greater things. But then as we look at uh, how God brings us along the way, and he'll give you very remedial tasks. He'll say, I just want you to do this. It doesn't make a lot of sense to you at the time. You say, I want you just to, uh, I want you to be the person to just uh, clean the glass, bring the glass and place it on the podium. That's all I want you to do. And, and, and if a person can't do that much, this is a very remedial task. You say, well, I'm called to the nations. Well, be faithful over a few things. And then the Lord says, I can reward you over many things. He said, but the assignment given is really the test to prepare you for the greater assignments. That's what God does. They have so much more, but I'm doing this not just to give you assignments. I'm going to give you assignments, but I'm also going to give you rewards. You see, the inheritance are, are yours as well. You inherit responsibilities. You, you, you will be ruler over many things. If you're faithful over a few things, you'll be a ruler over many things. But if you're not managing the few things, then how are you going to rule properly over many other things? So, so what he does, he prepares us for our responsibilities. Now, if he, uh, Ecclesiastes 3 and 10, you know, it talks about everything is a season of time for every person in heaven, time to live, time to die, it goes on and on and on and on. But then it gets to verse 10, it says, I have seen, I have seen the God-given task which the sons of men are to be occupied. I have seen the God-given task which the sons of men, and you can always say ought to be occupied, ought to be occupied, the things that people ought to be doing. I have seen what we ought to be doing. Now, understand this, the assignments given. I understand when God, he, this is what uh, the, the, he was saying here, Solomon was saying, I have seen the God-given task which the sons of men ought to be occupied. He said, you may be occupied with a whole lot of other things, he said, but I've seen what you ought to be doing. That's what he's saying in essence. I've already seen what you ought to be doing. Now, that's saying a whole lot. I've seen what mankind, I, I would put it this way. I've seen the position that the church ought to take and uh, the, the stand that we ought to be taking right now. That's what he's really saying in essence. I've seen that. I've seen the positional, I've seen the position that God would like for us to be in so that we can begin to, uh, we can begin to transform culture. We can change mindsets, uh, bridge the gap, change mindsets, and transform culture to the standard of Christ. He says, I've seen the God-given task which the sons of men are to be occupied. Now, now understand, this is God giving a glimpse into glory. He says, I'll let, you see in, I'll let you see the finished product as it was in Moses. When Moses uh, was, uh, you know, when he struck the rock rather than speak to the rock, God allowed him to go to the top of the mountain and look over into Canaan. He saw the promised land, but he was not permitted to enter into the promised land. But, but understand what happens. He says, I've seen the promised land. I've seen the, the place that God is out to take us. And I've seen the engagements that we ought to be involved in. Understand, if you don't see it, then it's hard to assign others to do the things that God would have them to do. He said, but, but not only have I seen the work that each ought to be occupied in, I've seen the assignments that we ought to be engaged. He said, but I've also seen the future. I've also seen the future. I've seen the end result of the work. That's what he's saying in essence. He says, when you're faithful in this endeavor, let me tell you already what the outcome will be. That's what the Lord is saying in essence. He said, the word helps us to understand that we're not engaged in exercises of futility. We're not just spinning our wheels and we're doing this thing, that thing, and the other without an end in mind. He said, but there's something that God is up to even as we engage in the work. What is God up to? He says he has made everything beautiful in its own time. He has made everything beautiful in its time. There is a time. We mentioned there's a time for every purpose, a season and purpose under the heaven. He said, but he has made everything beautiful 
but it will not be beautiful immediately. It will be beautiful ultimately. It will blossom, it will grow, it will flourish. But when, Lord, in its own time, he said, there will be a time when you'll see the beauty contained within it. But if you're not faithful in what God has assigned, then as it was beforehand, you crucify the Lord afresh because he's shown you enough to keep you going forward. Because if God's, you see, if God's promises are true and if God's grace is upon you and if God has given you a glimpse of his glory, that ought to be sufficient enough for you to want to finish the assignment that God has in fact given. So he's made everything beautiful. That's a promise. That's a promise from God. He's made everything beautiful in its own time. And then he says that now, now, okay, you made everything beautiful in its own time. And you are saying this to me, that the time will come when this thing will flourish. He said, but I did something else. This is what I'm giving you as a promise, but I'm going to give you something so that you'll stay, you'll have the wherewithal to remain faithful along the way. What will I do for you? What will I do for you, my son? What, will I, what am I going to do for you, my son? What am I going to do for you, my daughter? He said, what I'm going to do for you, just like I told you, Christ in you, the hope of glory, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the hope that will keep you moving forward is the fact that Christ is living on the inside of you. What I'm going to do for you, son or daughter, I'm going to place, I've placed eternity in your heart. I place eternity in your hearts. He said what he's done, in other words, you have a, a, a within you this, this sensing that there's something more to life than this. You have this sensing on the inside that your life will not end when your body uh, comes to its end. You see, God has placed eternity in their hearts. He placed eternity in their hearts. What he means is that he's given you the power of an endless life. He's given you that. That's a gift from God. You understand this, where you cannot see an end coming to your existence. And then you believe that he has made all everything beautiful in his own time. So that when you come to the end of your earthly life, you don't see corruption. You don't see things that are ruined, but you see things becoming all the more beautiful or blossoming or blooming. So he says, I place eternity in your hearts. He said, but in the meantime, I did a message one time between uh, one, as we were between the end of the year and the beginning of the next year, we call it in the meantime. But in this, in the meantime, he says, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to the end. In other words, no one can see the full picture. I would not let anyone be able to see the strategy from the end, from the beginning to end. He said, but there are certain things God reserves to himself. The secret things belong to God, but the things revealed belong to us. But there will always be secret things that God reserves for himself because he wants to always remain in the posture of being God. He will, uh, I was reading the other day, uh, it was, uh, it's a book, and it was talking about how he gave Joseph a ring, he gave Joseph a chain, a gold chain, all that, but he, he said, I'll give you uh, anything within the kingdom except the throne. See, God would not share his glory with another. I'll give you anything, but he said, but I, your inheritance will not be my throne, but he will always be the king of kings and he will always be the Lord of Lords. So in this, here's what he does. He says, uh, you'll never know all the work of God from the beginning to the end because he reserves the right. He even said, even when it came to Jesus Christ, he said to him, he said, uh, it's not for you to know the time or the season which the Father has reserved in his own power but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. He said, there are certain things that he reserves for himself. But he said, but all the other things he makes known to us, the things revealed are ours. So, so what happens as we think about living? You, we, you must prepare to live. You don't just live, you prepare to live. We must prepare ourselves to live. 
uh, uh, we have to understand the response. Uh, this is engaged in what I call responsible living. If, if you're not prepared, then how are you going to be? How are you going to engage in responsible living? You see, it, it's it's with uh, it's, it's it, with true uh, living. Uh, with true living, or with responsible living, comes responsibility. You see, responsibilities, shouldering responsibilities. In other words, I must give. Uh, I must give accountability or must give an account uh, for how I steward my life. And that's what we all must do. We must give an account as to how we steward our lives. We are stewards over the life that we're living right now. And we must uh, uh, understand this life, this life. We understand we talk about how we exchange this life, for eternal life, but we must steward this life in such a way that God is glorified and God is pleased. We must steward this way with my time, with my talents, with my treasures. I must steward my life, must be very careful, as to, not just in some areas, but in every area of life. We must be good stewards, faithful stewards within our lives. In other words, what I'm doing, does it glorify God? Does it glorify God? And does God enjoy it? And then when we get to place, that's, that's Westminster's catechism is the highest aim, greatest good is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. But then can I enjoy that which God enjoys so that my heart is in sync with his heart so we enjoy the same things. But if I'm merely bringing pleasure to him but not enjoying bringing pleasure to him, then I become a slave, a unwilling slave. And it's pretty much, did not I do these things in your name? I did it because you demanded those particular things. But the truth of the matter, the heart is divided or has drawn itself, withdrawn itself from him. Now, let me move on because we just have a few more minutes. But, but understand, this is what happens. Look at Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, when he was surrounded by the Syrian army, it was coming against him and uh, he was with his people and he wondered what he was going to do. So then he says, this is what he said here in Second Chronicles 20 and 2. He says, well, we have no power. We have no power against this great multitude that has come against us. In other words, look here, this thing is overwhelming. This, this, we look at COVID-19. We look at what's happening with the fires in, in California. Look at what's happening with the political situation. We said we have no power. We have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us. Look like they're throwing everything at us, including the kitchen sink. What can we do against all that's coming against us? And he says, nor do we know what to do. Oh, this, this is potent here. You see, we have no power. Neither do we know what to do. Because even if we had no power, we could still strategize based upon our wisdom and intellect if our intellect is intrinsic, if we had come up with a good plan, a good idea, then we can outwit the enemy. We can outthink him. But he says, we don't even know what to do. He said, but where are you standing, Jehoshaphat? He said, but our eyes are upon you. Our eyes are upon you. In other words, our focus is upon you. We're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He said, Lord, you led us to this place. You see, I was listening to you and I was following your lead. I was reading your word. I was, I was surrendering to your will. And this is the place that I end up. He says, but now understand it's going to be intriguing as to how you're going to work this thing out. In other words, when it looked like it's an impossibility, that's when we get excited. Because if God has placed us in an impossible situation, it's a setup. We're getting ready to see the glory of God like we've never, ever seen it before. I would say that at times when it looked like everything is working against us and, 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 and mountains, uh, 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 things begin to work against us, God is saying, I'm setting you up. I'm going to show you something that you otherwise would be incapable of seeing. That's what he said. The just shall live by faith. Because he is the author and the finisher of our faith. God is the one that's working out the detail. He is the one that's, that, that, that's, that, that's actually calling the shots. Because whatever is happening, I'm even talking about what the enemy is doing, what other, whatever any is doing. God is still overseeing and overriding even their strategies and their plans. 
Now, I'm closing, but look at this now. And we'll finish this later on because it's so much involved. In, how are you going to talk about life and, 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 and just compress it in just a few minutes? But uh, the Lord wants to understand that it is his life in us that uh, is most important. It is his life in us. It is the life of Christ in us. It is the life of Christ given full expression without any fleshly hindrances or fleshly interventions is when we allow Jesus to be Jesus and stop trying to be Jesus on our own. You see, that's what happens. We have to stop. I don't like this, that, or the other. Well, did, did, what did Jesus say about it? What about endurance? Can you endure hardship like a good soldier? Can you put up with stuff that you otherwise would not put up with? You see, uh, don't cave in. Don't give up because times are rough. You see, if you can't run with, with, with the, uh, the soldiers, with the footmen, rather, how do you expect to run with the horsemen? You can't run with the footmen. You, you, you can't run with the horsemen. You can't run with soldiers. So, so now, look at what he says. When we yield ourselves to the Lord. See, Paul had reached that point where he had given his all to the Lord in Philippians 1.21. And he said, for me to live is Christ. In other words, look at life now. He's defining life. He says, for me to live is Christ to live. For me to live is Christ to live. He said, in other words, I have no life apart from him. For me to live is Christ to live. For me to live is Christ to live. In other words, I have yielded my life to such a degree to the Lord that whatever he desired to say, whatever he desired to do, then I have yielded. I am willing to go there. I'm willing to go through that. He says, for me to live is Christ to live. So you see the full expression of Christ in me. And then... It did not negate the whole factor of death, but it just puts it in a different category. It just puts death in a different category. In other words, from death being a loss, he says, to die is gain. To die is gain. Why? Because for me to live is Christ to live. For me to live is Christ to live. So Christ is living in me. And if Christ is living in me, Christ can't die. So if Christ can't die, guess what? I can't die. So, but if I physically die, understand what has happened. Christ permitted me to die. And if Christ permitted me to die, then apparently I'm going to glory. You see, the glorification process is taking place. The Lord is ready to glorify me. He's ready now to expand me and show me more of what life is really about rather than this glimpse that I once had of life. He says, so now to die is gain, because now I will see as I'm seen, I will know as I'm known. He says, and then he goes on to say, but if I live on in the flesh, if I keep living in the flesh, this will mean fruit for my labor. If I keep living, then all I'm doing is putting forth fruit for my life. In other words, so that people can be blessed. In other words, his life was altruistic. He said everything about my life was being lived in such a way to benefit for the benefit of others. He said, I'm living my life so that the fruit of the spirit, others can begin to take hold of that fruit. He says, yet what I choose, I cannot tell. What I choose, I cannot tell. For I'm hard pressed between the two having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. He's caught between, I won't go through all that, caught between life and death. He said, but it'll be better for you that I remain. Why? Because there are still some things that I must impart while I'm still alive. But for my own sake, if I'm selfish, I just get on out of here. He said, but now he reached this point where he says, I want to stick around. Uh, so that you can hear another message, so that you can receive, derive the benefit of my life. That's a place, that's a good place to be. He's in a good place because when he finally got to the place of having to face Nero's chopping block, he could say that I fought a good fight, I've kept the faith, and I finished my course. Now it's later for me, the rewards that wait me, these awards, rewards rather, are imperishable. They're imperishable rewards that wait me. So, so you see, that's the posture that God would have us to be in. So now life itself is redefined. Life, uh, we'll talk about it next time. 
First of all, we must understand how life is defined. And then we have to understand how life is to be redefined so we can understand the fullness of life, that we may experience the fullness of his glory. So, Father, thank you for your word and thank you for helping us to uh, see that it's more, life is more than the abundance of things that we accumulate for ourselves and things that we uh, attribute life to be, food, clothing, raiment, and those kinds of things. But you're showing us what life is real, really all about. And we're taking the time to share this because we want people to understand what it really means to live and to understand the life that you offer is much greater than the life that they had received from birth. But you want to make each new creations so that as a result of that, they are being taught how to live all over again. As a person who's been handicapped or and lost the use of faculties, they have to be taught all over again how to use those faculties. The same thing applies once we come to the end of this life, then we are open to receive spiritual instructions so we know how to live this life that you've given us. So teach us your ways and lead us and guide us in your paths. In this, we give you the honor, praise, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Uh, I'm teaching on, 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 on these fundamentals on Wednesday and Sunday morning. I'm going to go back to dealing with some of the prophetic issues as well, because we need to understand. We need a balance. We need to understand what is happening in our day and time and how we have posture ourselves. But at the same time, we need to make sure that a good foundation is laid in our lives. I mentioned to Elder Gail Thomas uh, yesterday and, and, and to uh, Pastor Greg Johnson as well, is that one of the things I'm proposing even at our church is to even begin catechism classes. There's something I was able to attend when I was in the Methodist church. And I understand the necessity of that, how we need to be catechized, how you call it now, and taught the basics, the fundamentals of faith. We have a new beginnings class and the like, but I'm talking about really going deeper into these fundamentals so that there's a good foundation on which to build. So uh, as we put those classes together, we have several teachers that will be teaching various courses as we develop this, as Elder Gail leading it up, will develop this. And we trust that uh, many, not just those that are attending our church at this time, but many others will have an interest in being a part of the instructions that will take place as we continue to lay a good foundation, as Paul said, within the lives of those that will hear it and receive it. So let us know if you're interested, and we'll by all means uh, uh, communicate with you concerning the future instructions that will go forth from members of our staff, our team, our ministerial team, as we engage in uh, catechism. Amen. So I mentioned it, we just talked about it yesterday, but I'm putting it out now so that may, I'm committing ourselves to, uh, to getting this course uh, developed. Amen. Amen. See, if, if you're not saved, you heard about salvation and the rescue that God offers us. That's what salvation is all about, saving us, rescuing us from, yeah, the power of Satan, but also the penalty, uh, the power of sin, the penalty of sin, and ultimately the very presence of sin. Because what has happened, Satan uh, is, is the enemy. But understand, when the flesh is under the control of the enemy, then we become an enemy to our, unto ourselves. So we have to be saved from ourselves. So in this, the Lord is wanting to give you a new life. That's what life is all about. It's come to give you new life. Come to give you life and that more abundantly. So if you're not yielded your life to the Lord and, and understand, let, let me put it this way. If, if you're not despising the old habits that you once, in, you once entertained, first of all, we understand being freed from those habits. But then the other is despising the habits because your love for the Lord is greater than the love for other things. But if you're not despising those old habits and desiring to be set free from them, then you need salvation. You need salvation because he'll give you a new heart. That's what God does. And then he'll renew your mind. And as a result of your mind being renewed, your activities will follow. But there are many people that had not really been saved, have not reached that place of true conversion 
and 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 as a result of it, they've been, uh, I would say, this easy believism or hyper grace teachings have been to believe that it doesn't require a change of mind, a change of heart, change of attitude. But let me be very candid with you. It does require a change of heart. It begins with the heart. It'll give you a new heart. So if you've not surrendered your life to the Lord, by all means, this is the day and hour you need to come to the Lord before it's too late. It would be it would be a tragedy. I was thinking the other day, that's what we talked about catechism, that you've been instructed all these years and still miss out on God. But uh, I don't want any of you to miss it. When we get to heaven, we want to see you there. We don't want to ask questions, where are you? Because it didn't take. But we want to give the instructions and even express the love to you by being straightforward so that you won't be missing in action. So if you've not given your life to the Lord, by all means, let this be the day. Let this be the hour of your surrender. And, and we'll pray this together, but at the same time, you need to walk with someone. You need to be a part of a fellowship. You need to be under the tutelage of instructions that could help you to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord. So let's pray this together. Father, just pray this with me. Thank you for the grace that you've extended to me this day, that I was postured to hear your truth. And you've given me the power to respond. So I ask you, Lord, to come into my life as Jesus, to come into my life and to live his life in me and through me. I believe in my heart, Father, that you raised him from the dead. And the very power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power that can change me now. I surrender my all to you. And I thank you for salvation. And I commit my all to you going forward. I give you the honor and I give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray it in a minute, let us know. We'd like to communicate with you. And I want to personally call you, but want to connect you with other believers so that you can uh, be a part of a fellowship of believers that will pray for you constantly and walk with you so that the issues that you may have in your walk, you can have someone praying with you and walking with you through those particular issues. So by all means, there's a number uh, you can call. Uh, and also you can text us, however you might do it, but let us know that you're interested in, that you gave your life to the Lord. And if you're interested in membership, that you want to be a part of this fellowship. Amen. Amen. So let us now prepare our hearts to give unto the Lord as we honor him through giving. And this is all that have heard the word of God. And you trust that the word is contributed to your growth, your development. And you want to encourage uh, this ministry to make an impact upon many lives. You see, your giving is an encouragement to us and to this entire cross-culture church uh, to uh, move forward in that. You're holding our hands up so that we can uh, be, uh, the, let's say the influence can be extended. And I believe that there are many people, as it was years ago, we could get back on radio and television and other places so that the word can become even all the more widespread. If it's worthy of your support, by all means, ask God what you ought to do in your giving. Some can do more than others, but whatever you are capable of doing, by all means, be responsive to the initiative of God. And then if you're a member of this church, be faithful in your stewardship as you, with your tithe, with your offerings, and we praise God for your faithfulness over the years. This has been a long uh, time away from each other, but many of you have been faithful in your stewardship over these months. So we pray that you'll remain faithful and continue to ask God what you ought to do in supporting ministry. So Father, thank you for this opportunity of giving. We give you the praise and honor for upholding this ministry, holding this ministry together uh, helping us to see what we would otherwise be incapable of seeing and hear what we would otherwise be incapable of hearing, that we may do those things that we otherwise would not do. And Lord, we want to always speak truth to power. We want to bring a balanced word. So we are asking you to continue 
even as others are supporting us, continue to pour into their hearts and lives the truth that will transform them. So I speak blessings upon each giver, each person that I've received, and we honor you for this opportunity of sharing together the life of Christ. And we give you the praise for it now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you, and we appreciate your time. And uh, we just want you to share this message with others. Make sure that you uh, share. That is on. If you're Facebook, you'll see areas for sharing. And also, uh, like us. Put the like. I don't know all about this, but like us button. That's also part of it. And and just all the other ways that uh, you will uh, let us know that you're there. And we'd like for you to mark yourself present as well. If you're watching with family members, let us know who you are and how many we're watching so that we can have record of your attendance. We keep record of those that are uh, watching, that are attentive to the message. And in that, that's an encouragement to us to know that there are numbers of you that are, are coming on and you're watching this uh, message and watching this ministry and it's making a difference in your life. And just send us a note as to uh, how you are being blessed through the message. So until uh, Sunday morning, this will be the first Sunday in the month of October. Isn't time moving fast? This will be the first Sunday again, Communion Sunday, this coming Sunday. So by all means, prepare uh, for communion with your bread and your, uh, your grape juice, or whatever you're taking with that as we commune together on this coming Sunday morning. So may the grace of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon each and every one. And Lord, may the communion of the saints as we come together, even as we will be coming together on Sunday, communing together, Lord, let it be more than just a uh, ceremony, but let it be an expression of the unity that reside among us as being on one accord. So bless your people. We give you the honor, we give you the praise, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless.